Welcome action fans, and thanks for joining us for another edition of All 90s Action, All the Time, as we continue our journey through Sylvester Stallone's 90s back catalogue. I'm your host Scott Murphy, and on today's episode, we are looking at the comic book calamity that is Judge Dredd. As always, alongside me to detect this particular outing is Bloodhound Pick's co-host, screenwriter, and a man who would never betray the law. It's Mr. Craig Drahan. I knew you would say that. And I knew you would say that. Yeah. Uh, so as always, <laughs> before diving into this one, uh, a little bit of background information for you. Judge Dredd debuted in U.S. theaters on June 30th, 1995. It was directed by Danny Cannon, who would go on to direct. Uh, I still don't. I still know what you did last summer, um, but has basically carved a niche for himself, uh, mainly in TV. Uh, post that, he did episodes of CSI. He was a producer and director on uh, Gotham and Pennyworth, uh, and done done other TV stuff. Uh, the story was by Michael. De Luca, uh, who is now the chairman of MGM and had previously written scripts for Freddy's Dead, not so good, but also In the Mouth of Madness, mm. so pretty good. And um, the other person who's credited for the story is William Wisher Jr., who co-wrote Terminator 2 and uh, It Chapter 1, whereas the screenplay was credited to, to William Wister Jr. again, and Stephen E. D'Souza, who had written uh, such action hits, or co-wrote such action hits as 48 Hours, Commando, and Die Hard. Although this movie was made in 1995, and Stephen E. D'Souza, boy, did he have a fucking year in 1994. <laughs> so he wrote Beverly Hills Cop 3, co-wrote, the Flintstones, and wrote and directed the Street Fighter film. <laughs> Whoosh, that was a 1994 to forget. Yeah. In terms of reviews, this movie is currently sitting at a 5.6 out of 10 on IMDb, 20% on Rotten Tomatoes based on 54 reviews. It doesn't have a Metacritic score, and it's got a 2.4 on Letterbox. And it didn't fare that much better at the box office, although it did end up making a total of 113 million point five point uh, five million dollars but that was on an 85 million dollar budget so was uh, a loser for the studio and in its opening US weekend rather embarrassingly it was even beaten out by Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie so there you go so Craig when did yeah. you first see this one <laughs> I probably saw it when it first came out so I am a big comic book fan I'm a big my brother who's much older than me he had a I can't remember the comic now it was like one a stray issue of Judge Dredd that I read constantly until it fell apart or well reread and but where I grew up and even in the states that Judge Dredd wasn't really that big at all I think it was one of those ones where you'd have to go into like a very you know specific comic shop in the yep. major city and stuff and you couldn't really find it anywhere else so besides that single issue i really only knew about you know watching the movie and i liked the movie but i real and i know we talked about this prior because you're asking how i could be a fan of <laughs> judge dread the comic and like the movie so much when i was younger i think um especially watching it now i realized it wasn't necessary because i always had an issue with the plot and many elements but it was just the the world i think and the production design and some Something about, I was like, it just, obviously I wouldn't want to live in Mega City 1, but I just mm. love the world so much. And that's it why. does look cool. And, yeah. and like even as I think like I was more disappointed with it yeah. as a kid um, just because I read the comic book first. Um, so like it was 
one of those things where I mean I think I didn't see it at the cinema so um because we didn't go to the cinema all that often mm-hmm. so I think I must have saw it either when it came out on video or I might have even seen it like a few years later when it, when it was on telly and then yeah by that stage um I had I'd already been reading the comic book for a while and um I think I, I, I you know, like I didn't hate it. I, I'd write me like, you know, yeah. and I watched it a few times and um I, I thought the world was cool and even as a kid I thought like some of the action was cool. Um pro- probably, you know, as a kid thought some of the action was cooler than I necessarily do now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um so yeah, I, I like that element. I think like what disappointed me is because like I was like a big fan of Judge Red and I was a big fan of Stallone, so I thought this was gonna be like, yeah, yeah. But then I suppose like having that that background of reading the comics and like I, at one point I was like a subscriber to the the Judge Dread magazine like you know get like okay. monthly you know a thing and um it, I suppose like the characters just didn't make sense to me yeah like, of like the character that I'd read and then it's like the, this character on screen it was just like it didn't feel the same so it was like because I I just remember it kind of being a a, a little bit of a dis disappointment i you know like um there were certain things in in the 90s i i would rank it alongside it i I wouldn't put it quite as high up as episode one but i'd certainly say like you know of things that kind of disappointed me in my childhood there was like the doctor (laughs) tv movie in 96 which was a bit of a letdown and this was a little bit of a letdown um 98 godzilla that was a letdown yeah and um episode one they're 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 amongst the kind of 90s letdowns from my childhood <laughs> <You're Rosebud. laughs> that's what you'll have a, that'll be your rosebud as your are um, <laughs> a list of these movies things that let me down as a kid yeah. <laughs> that i was really excited yeah. for <laughs> no, and i agree and i think watch even watching it for this because i haven't seen it now in several years or yeah for a while but um yeah, I, I haven't thought, seen it since like my early twenties, or like yeah. maybe maybe even my late teens or early twenties. So we're talking probably nearly, um, you're you're talking at least fifteen years, if not yeah. more. <laughs> but I so watching it, I'm like, well, if they did it right, Stallone wouldn't be a bad dread if Stallone was willing to actually go. I don't know. That place, it's like on paper, it could work. That's what it feels like. It just, you know, it doesn't, obviously, because dread doesn't require. I mean, I mean, I love the the twenty twenty or the twenty twelve one, but mm. the character of dread itself doesn't actually require. I think, you know, a substan- substantial acting chops or all this other stuff. No, but it is commitment yeah, it, 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 to that role. <laughs> yeah, you have to, you have to commit to it. I think, I think that's what it is. Like basically. And I think Carl Urban does a really good job of that in yeah. in, in Dread, the, the 2012. But no, I don't, I don't think it requires to be, you know, you don't have to be fucking Robert De Niro um, to play Judge Dread. You just have to be committed to that character. You just, like, because, like, you know, I don't think that, I mean, I suppose he's had the odd role that, you know, like, he can you know, but stretch himself a bit. But, like, for example, Clint Eastwood tends to play Clint Eastwood, right? Yeah. And that's essentially that kind of blank, emotionless, slightly surly, kind of alwaysly, simmeringly pissed off the the thing that Clint Eastwood does as Dirty Harry or as the man with no name, you know, in in, in like the Dawes trilogy and stuff like that. Yeah, that's a, that's essentially the energy of yeah. uh, you know you, you should be given out as as Judge Judge Dredd, you and, know. And you and you could just tell that, especially more so even now, and for people re- or fans of the comic books, that you know obviously it is Hollywoodized in a way, and that you know I know in the states it's hard for us to because Judge Dredd in the comics, especially if you read um what there's. Like the single, the issue America or stuff like that. He is essentially, uh, even though he's the protagonist, is a working for a fascist government. Correct. You know, and there is that satire to it and all of that. And but there's so much within this movie where it's like, no, we need to really show he is the you know, the hero. That the law is a you know in their world is a good thing, and like it's just all these bad criminals. And I don't know. It's it's interesting. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. I, it almost, I suppose, yeah, it flips the whole, I guess, the intention of the original, um, you know, yeah, the original comic. And I think, 
I think there's a thing here as well where, like, obviously, well, this is the first time we've covered a comic book movie, so maybe yeah. we should talk a little bit about, like, comic book movies in the 90s. Not too yeah. much, because we need <laughs> yeah. to, we really need to get into the plot of the movie at some point. And this is your official spoiler warning. Um, we are going to go fully into the whole plot of the movie, spoilers and all, so if you've not seen the movie, uh, you don't want it spoiled, then um, go watch the movie, come back, listen to this. Um, but uh, we are going to fully explore all of Judge Dredd yeah. um, after these messages. No, yeah. let's... <laughs> um, but, yeah, so this is the first time we talked about comic book movie on the podcast. Um, maybe to talk a, just very briefly on that of like so at this time Hollywood obviously didn't take comic book movies seriously mm-hmm. at all and just thought they were kind of stupid um and made them in that vein and uh, there's a clear kind of like talking down to the the audience yeah just being like kind of well these these are just these are just silly things why would anybody care anyway and you know because obviously buying up rights to comic strips and comic books became, you know, there was a kind of boom of that, uh, given the success of 1989 Batman. And then, you know, you get this kind of whole spate of comic book adaptations, big money comic book adaptations, nearly all of which totally fail, mainly because the creatives behind it don't care about it and don't understand it. But then, you know, you obviously you've got things like Dick Tracy and the Rocketeer and mm. the Shadow and, um, a whole bunch, whole bunch of other films, you yeah. know. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then like the year, <laughs> the year after this, you would get like uh, uh, barbed wire. And um, yeah, the, actually, I tell you what, in terms of like bad movies that I did enjoy as a kid, the year after this, nineteen ninety six, you'd also get The Phantom, which oh is, yeah, there we go. yeah, which which genuinely entertained me as a child. Yeah. <laughs> I've not watched it in years and years. It's probably yeah. terrible. I know. Um, but, uh, yeah, I had a soft spot but, for the Phantom. I always give credit to, especially because I love Demon Knight so much, to Billy Zane. Yeah. Like, he, he commits. To he, he really does. He really, like, yeah. he does know exactly what movie he's in. He really does commit to that role. And then I think, like, that that's what it, it has. It That's a movie that has a very committed, very consistent tone, even if it is a bad movie. Yeah. Um, but we're not we're not here to talk about that. <laughs> and um, but also in 1995, you also had Tank Girl, which I do have a, a soft spot for. And it was a year for campy uh, comic book movies because also uh, we had Batman Forever, which yeah. is a movie we will talk about at a later date. Yeah. But is is there anything you wanted to say about that that kind of nineties? Uh, comic book mo- boom before we kind of move into the pl- dissecting, breaking down the plot of this one. No, I mean, I think you covered it all. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the 90s, you would get, that would kind of be the, the, the middle ground, I feel like, with Blade, where it was, they were took the creative freedom, or, yeah, it was kind of campy in a way, but then it also did earn enough money, which, you know, they always will talk about how Blade led to the success then of... Like then Spider Man, which then set off the whole what we have yeah. today, basically. Yeah, I think like it blazed the path for X Men in two thousand. Yeah, which, and then you get Spider Man in two thousand and two. That kind of, and it, I suppose even at that stage, like comic book movies aren't necessarily taken seriously, but at least like the, the kind of directors behind them have a better idea of the tone, and you know, yeah. like. Um, have more love for the for the source material and stuff like that so like it is done with more kind of uh heart and stuff and uh you know and it gets it gets better and then i suppose it, that in eventually leads up to you know the year of 2008 where like hollywood starts taking comic books movies really seriously because then that's the year you get both the dark knight and iron man the yeah. first the first installment in the mcu and then it's you know Obviously, comic book movies now rule the world. Um, yeah. so, <laughs> but it wasn't like that in the 90s. Man. And yeah, Blade was the one that kind of was the course corrector um, because it, most of the 90s comic book adaptations that you got 
were terrible. There's only like really a handful of good ones in the 90s. You've got like I I do have a soft spot for um for Batman Forever and um and, and Tank Girl, but there, but in terms of like really good films, you've got Batman Returns, you've got The Crow, yeah. uh, you've got um well Dark Man's actually not based on a comic book, but it's like basically Sam Raimi like couldn't get the rights to do The Shadow, so made yeah. Dark Man. So I, I suppose we can could throw that in there, and then you've got Blade. And then yeah. you've just got all the other ones. Yeah. Like 1990s <laughs> The Punisher. <laughs> I think it was exactly 90. I can't remember. Is Was that 90 or was that 89? Oh. I, I think it's like listed as 89. And maybe it didn't come Dolph out. Dolph Lundgren. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. It was. Yeah, it was 89. 89. So that yeah. Was, yeah. Dolph Lundgren. There's still not been a good Punisher movie. Like, because like, there's the Thomas Jane one, which is not good, and then there's the Punisher War Zone, <laughs> which I I hated. So which, like, yeah. which that one is a throw, but or she, I read, this, I actually watched the whole behind the scenes and everything because I found it for Punisher a War Zone. <laughs> yeah, for a dollar, the Blu-ray at the like Seven Eleven. And sounds. yeah, she talked about she wanted to make it like the ultra violent version of. Like Dick, the Dick Tracy movie, so just like very hyper stylized comic book, I guess. Right. Yeah. I don't know. It just wasn't. <laughs> just wasn't a fan. Um, <laughs> let's let's uh, like before we before I delve any more yeah. into uh, Punisher Warzone and the lack of of good uh, Punisher uh, films, um, let's uh, let's talk about let's let's get into it now. Let's yes. let's talk about uh, Judge Dredd. Which yeah. was uh, which was made by uh, Hollywood Pictures or Disney in disguise. Yeah, <laughs> which would explain a lot of stuff about why it is the way it is. <laughs> yeah, apparently it was like, it was like a, a subsidiary they they had that made like kind of R-rated movies, like the R-rated movies. That, actually, Hollywood Pictures did make uh, some some good films. Uh, you know, like in in their time. You know, they, they made films like uh, Dead Presidents. That was a movie oh, yeah. that came out in 1995. That was that was a good film. Um, another movie that came out in 1995, a good film, uh, Crimson Tide, made that one. Okay. Um, yeah, of course, some other good ones in the repertoire. Uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, how, how does um, how does Judge Dredd begin? <laughs> this, I think, is our first opening like this, maybe so far. Where and I haven't seen it in a while. Where you get the the scrolling of the basically the exposition of the world building, but then yeah. somebody's reading it as well. What Not anybody's reading it. Yeah. No. Not any old buddy. It's uh, our good old friend James Earl Jones. What yeah. a voice that man has! <laughs> and talking about how you know um, with the world, the world changed and everything kind of became with the climate and became a scorched earth, except a few kind of mega cities in the country or even around the world. And then it goes into how law like went, went out the window and it all went to crap. And so they had to bring in a new type of law maker, uh, somebody that was judge, jury and executioner. And that's yeah, basically all it is, and then it sets us up for you see this ship flying from kind of this wasteland into this um, very elaborate like wall, and then they you know are are docking, which we're learning are like a bunch of prisoners that have been I guess released from their their sentence. Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to say that. Like I don't know if it was just because it had that opening scroll, and then you know, like um, it was James Earl Jones, but it felt quite Star Wars. Like, yeah, <laughs> just that way when it's like that ship's docking, and the guy who greets the ship kind of looks like a kind of Mandalorian, and yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, wow, this feels very. I don't remember it being quite this Star Wars this opening. Well, even the the special, which will pop up later, not the judges, but like the special units. They almost have, even though they're in all black, they almost have like a 
stormtroopery element yeah, to it or something. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. But that's where we get to our the first kind of character we're introduced is not Judge Dredd or any of them, but <laughs> good old Rob Schneider. Who we almost man. follow as like a protagonist for a bit until he just disappears for many minutes of the movie. Yes. So he is the person who kind of introduces us to Mega City One and um because you know they go through the, the, the big the big metal doors and then we arrive in Mega City One and we kind of see Mega City One through his eyes. Oh he is returning because he's kind of like ah home. Um so he he's returning back to it. But he's looking at it with, with wonder. And then he gets a cab ride, um which you know, even though this movie was made like two years before, uh but again it's it's just it all feels like all these kind of sci fi things all mixed together because like the cabs they look like uh from from Fifth Element, but yeah. uh, you know, like uh maybe Fifth Element nicked it from this movie because like like I said, Fifth Element came out in ninety seven. <laughs> Which I know, well, Fifth Element, didn't they take from um, that comic book, The Inkle? The uh, Inkle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Inkle, like, yeah. Did, yeah, yeah. They, they did. They took a lot from that to, yeah. to the point where I think, like, Jodorowsky tried to sue them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, any listeners, um, definitely, you could, you should, if you are a fan of action movies and and comic books, uh, definitely check out the Inkle because it's yeah. like it's a it's a great comic book. Uh, it's very surreal and um, yeah, I highly highly yeah. recommend that. And it's kind of the basis for a ton of sci-fi now. Yeah, lo- loads of shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so we get ki- this is kind of where we get, which I know we were talking about before. There's, there's like the the world that they set up. It, there's the satire in it, and you start to see it where what it's called um, heaven. I can't remember the place he's supposed to be living is um, heaven's he- heaven, heaven heavenly heights. Yeah, and he thinks you know he flies over this very luxurious pool that's really high up. And he thinks that's it, but then it starts kind of dropping down, and you know even the computer itself is saying be careful. You know, riots and you have to be, yeah, just kind of warning because they're going and the lower you go, the worse the city gets and the more slum-like and the more crime-ridden everything is. And yeah, there's all these moments until, you know, obviously until Dread shows up that have these, you know, where you yeah. think, okay, you know the comic book at least enough to, <laughs> you're kind of adding it in a little bit. But. Well, this is the thing, like, I mean, according to everything I've read about the movie is Danny Cannon, um, who was the, the director of the film, uh, he, he is British, he was a, a fan of the comic book, uh, apparently, you know, like in the kind of little making of documentary that you can watch on yeah. YouTube, uh, which is called Stallone's Law. Um, (laughs) like he says in that, like he was a fan of comic book when when he was like 10 years old. And, um, but you know, it had a lot of production issues and there was a lot of bunning heads between director and star, particularly when it came to tone. And, um, yeah. And it, it seems like by the time it went into post, like he was pretty much shut out of the edit. Like the yeah. director Danny Cannon, and um, yeah, I think um, Stone had a, a good amount of say in, in in the final in the final cut of the movie, and um, so I don't know. I don't know if there's like, uh, obviously Danny Cannon wanted to do some stuff that didn't make it in the movie at all. Um, apparently, there is a different cut of the movie, the the, the Cannon cut that is uh, darker and has more violence and uh, some of the abrupt edits later on in the movie are explained by the fact that okay. there, is, there is this more violent cut and I, I don't know and again I do not know enough details on that cut if it is more satirical or if it's just basically this movie but with bloodier yeah. um, you know like so I, I don't know 
We'll um, start a, a whole petition. Release the release the <laughs> cannon cup. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Apparently, because apparently this film was submitted to the um, uh, what's what's your one uh, the MPAA. That's oh, right. Yep. Yep. Yeah, apparently it was submitted to them five times because they kept giving it an NC-17. So four times they gave it an NC-17. And then, uh, like, yeah, it was eventually cut down enough that they gave it an R rating. So oh. clearly the original cut is way more violent. Yeah. Um, but, yes, if the I don't know if the story makes more sense or if it, it doesn't feel quite as jumbled, or it has that more satirical uh, tone, but that's that's all I know. That obviously okay. that cuts way more violent. Okay, and which would have been fun, but yeah, I, I mean, it's kind of night and day when he arrives. But I know first off we get him with or Rob Schneider, <laughs> basically playing Fergie. Yeah, Fergie, and then. You know, seeing this riot and say, making the jokes and that, well, at least it's better than prison. And then going up to his, his new housing area, his apartment, but it is being occupied by a whole gang, which one of the, uh, the leader of them is, um, James yeah. Remar. Yep, there we go. Yep. Who uh, played uh, Ajax in, in, in the, in the Warriors. Yeah. Um, amongst other, loads of other things, like, um, he always plays, kind of either psychotic characters or slimy characters or like um yeah you just I, I i don't know like some actors just have those faces and you just you just see james dreamer's face on screen and you're just like Ugh, it's yeah. easy <laughs> yeah. he's he goes uncredited in this like he's not he's not credited oh. yeah. yeah i wonder if he did it as a because it feels like more of a cameo thing than a yeah owed somebody a favor or was doing somebody a favor <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so Fergie basically gets lassoed into this gang. Yeah, that are just firing on the crowd in the in the street, and they're having a turf war, a block basically, war. Yeah, block war. And then you know he obviously doesn't want to be there, and he keeps trying to get out of it, but they keep either grabbing him and pulling him back in, things like that. And then two judges arrive: a rookie, and then Hershey. Who, Played by Diane Lane. Yep. And they're being, they're taking cover because there's all this fire upon them. And then that's when we finally, they call for assistance. And then they, I, I did, yeah. <laughs> I laughed at this, but because I was just like, it's just such a random joke of just being like, so um, she calls, uh, George Hershey calls in for backup on the corner of Abbott and Costello. And I was <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. See, and that's why it has like that moment. And there's even a moment where, where it's, you have the computer talking about the violence. And then there's the robot going by talking about, um, please eat recycled food, you know, and things like that. So you can kind of see yeah. these little hints of little like, hints of, uh, little hints of satire. Yes. I did yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. Like I, yeah. The robot says, please. Please eat recycled food. It's good for the environment and it's okay for you. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh. you know, so it has this whole opening of, wow, there's like, there's something here. The war, and even for today's stand, I watched, I rented the Blu ray, um, but I watched it and I was like, well, you know, for 95, the, the production design and even some of the CGI stuff is, looks pretty good. It's well, yeah, really, I mean, like, yeah. it, it, <sighs> I mean, it had a pretty big budget. Yeah. You know, like, you know, $85 million in, in 95. I mean, I was looking up kind of budgets of movies um, of that time. And there's only like a couple of movies in, in 95 that were made for like more money. Yeah. Like, so you had Die Hard with a Vengeance apparently had a budget of $90 million. Batman Forever had a budget of $100 million. And then Waterworld broke the world record with its $175 million budget um, okay. that year. Uh, so, like, yeah, so there's, like, three other movies that year that, that had bigger budgets. So, I yeah. mean, like, this is... And apparently it took, like, a year uh, to make Mega City 1 in uh, Shepherd and Studios in, you know, like, in England. 
Yeah. No, it, I mean, yeah, it, that about, like, there's no talking down on that. The production designers, everybody, it's one of those movies that we've had at a lot of, like, or one of those conversations we've had with a lot of Stallone films of being like, you know, this part is really good. Like, the whoever's doing the sound or the production or, you know, the technical yeah. people. Yes. Like, so big shout out up, to production yeah. designer Nigel Phelps, uh, who did the production design on, on this movie, because he nails it. <laughs> yeah, but then um, then we get a basically a complete. You can really feel it the like the tonal shift right when Judge Dredd arrives. You know, it, it's trying to not show his face, and you know, he's more. He's not even that grizzled, I guess, as you would expect, or you know, serious. He's just kind of talking down to her. She's saying, "Well, these bullets have a range of two hundred yards and we're 300 yards away or something like that so yeah, why are you so, even so, taking so, cover and you know yeah 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 yeah. because um yeah i suppose like we should mention that the way he is introduced is like with a uh, stereotypical uh action movie yeah. <laughs> hero shot so we get like and um it's it's a real loving shot of him you know so we we get a shot of the the the, the motorbike the um, what are they called again? Lawmasters? Is that mm-hmm. guns? Yeah. The, the, the lawmasters, the, 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 the bikes. Yeah, um, I think that's what they're called. Yeah. Yeah, because the guns are the law givers. Um, yeah. So the, the bikes are the lawmasters. So, like, yeah, you get a show of the lawmaster, he parks up. Um, uh, yeah, and then we get a shot of his boots, and then we, like, scan, camera scan, pans all the way up to, to his helmet. Which he currently has on, uh, so so yes, uh, epic hero shot to, and then of course it is the first time where he says, and the, yeah, which yeah, we and get I, a lot of, and also like it is the first time we get his apparent catchphrase. I knew you would say that, <laughs> yeah, and out because that's what it feels like in this whole movie. Is they're like catchphrases are big, big right now. So let's. There's that one. There's. I knew you'd say that. There's. I am the law. And then there's. Um, Quarters. The courts adjourned. Yeah. Or, where they set it up like it's supposed to. It's like this will go perfectly on the t-shirts or on the action figures when you press the you know the button. They can say that. Yeah, and this is part of my problem with like Stallone's performance is just that. Dread, Dread just isn't this. Yeah. He's just, he's not, Dread isn't James Bond. He's not quippy. He's like, you know, he, like, what makes Judge Dread funny is his extreme lack of humor. Yeah. Like, the fact that he has no sense of humor, the fact that he is completely buttoned down, the, the fact that he is just kind of this, this grizzled kind of, you know, like, and he has no emotion. Like, that sometimes comes across as funny. And, like, it just, there's lots of comedy within the Judge Dredd world, but it's just not the comedy that you find in this movie. And and it's not even, like, other. you know, it's not like the other characters are not over the top. There's plenty of over-the-top characters within the Judge Dredd universe, but Dredd isn't one of them. Yeah. Which is interesting because based on what we've talked about with other Stallone movies and you have all these over the top people and he's the one that's like playing it down or almost phoning it in. It's like here was his opportunity <laughs> to, like, you know, to almost you could just play into you're given it like here's you just have to play into what you've already been doing in these other movies just maybe a little bit more and then, you know. Um, it'll be fine. Like it'd be a fine film, <laughs> at least you know, as much as it can be. Yeah, I mean, like there's there's other problems with the, the yeah, script and many stuff other like that. But, you know, like, um, but yeah, at least Dread would kind of make sense, you know, if he kind of more but like, but yeah, he decides to. This is the movie he decides to ham it up, which yeah. feels completely wrong for the guy. And usually, you know, I'm, I'm quite entertained by like you know having my hero hammy hammy hero hammy villain it doesn't bother me but like in this particular case it just doesn't make sense to to the character and maybe that it just does come from the perspective of being a fan of the comics and knowing 
that yeah. character, um, and maybe that doesn't that doesn't feel as egregious to to other people. But um, yeah, what? it doesn't. It never it never really sat well with me, and um, rewatching it still doesn't sit well with me. Well, and that was uh, because Diane Lane throughout it will make some comments about. Like be, him being human or showing signs of humanity or a bunch of stuff in regards to that. And for me watching it, especially this time, it's like, well, he is, he has been showing emotion. Like it's not like, you know, I guess, you know, the comic books like we've talked about or even the Carl Urban version. Yeah. Where, where, and where yeah. he, I think he plays the character right because that character, yeah. you know, he does play it like the man with no name, you know, like yeah. he, he does play it with, this lack of emotion and that does come across funny sometimes you know because it's such a lack of emotion it's such a void of emotion but like yeah like he's super emotional like yeah. most of like you know most of the movie like he's like angry in a really pissy way like, like he yeah he's people keep saying like what a lack of emotion he has and you know he should show more emotion and i'm like He's showing lots of emotions. He's emotions all over the place here. You know, he just because just he's kind of growling things doesn't mean he's not emotional. In fact, that that shows a kind of a big level of emotion. If I yeah. the over the top growling, yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so we get it. <laughs> so he comes. He does his, his quips. He does kills his the catch, gang. Yeah, catchphrase. And then he basically, yeah, he kills one batch. So there are two gangs that decide in different rooms that decide, I guess, to work together throughout it. Yeah. He kills one. The rookie is all excited because he wants to now take one and he gets killed. And then Judge Dredd then, you know, kills all of them. And obviously he's dispensing the justice throughout it, saying the, the year, or, you know, that destruction of property one year that'd be one year and one year and then something else five years and then killing an officer and james remar is saying oh well let me guess life and as he's pulling the gun judge dread judge dread shoots him saying death and then yeah yeah that's <laughs> and again yeah <laughs> and it's, and again we get another hit from bond dread <laughs> yeah and surprisingly, it's not even that exciting, the whole shootout. Like, it goes by really quick, and it, it's like, oh, okay. That was it. I guess that <laughs> He just happened. took down this game. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's talking to Hershey, who is giving the whole showing emotion. And, you know, and that's, they're having this little back and forth where he's even kind of being flirty in a way that it almost, yeah. They're kind of playing this little flirty element that, again, is not really as much in the comic. Which, um, but then the robot goes by, and but the robot has a different sounding voice because it sounds like Fergie. <laughs> <laughs> it has a strange Rob Schneider feel to it. <laughs> yeah, and he knows the difference, Judge Dredd. So they finally find him, and he's trying. In the, the robot, he was hacking it to kind of get away and be, and he's trying to plead his case saying that, you know, I was just trying to save myself and they were shooting and, you know, obviously Judge Dredd saying, well, you could have jumped out the window to avoid, you know, breaking a law. Well, it's 40 floors. I would have died. Well, you wouldn't have, at least that's not. Yes, apparently, su- apparently suicide yeah. is legal in, 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 in yeah, Mega City One. <laughs> also, and, yeah, like, that's- I must say, the character of Fergie is so annoying in this film. Yeah. You know, if you were to do, I, I don't, I do not know. Like, maybe we should after this episode, like, do a poll because, yeah. like, I definitely think that in terms of like sci-fi action cinema, Fergie is in, like, my top three most irritating characters alongside Jar Jar Binks <laughs> and Chris Tucker's character in The Fifth Element. Oh, I, I'd put him ahead of Chris Tucker, definitely. I know Chris Tucker is annoying in it, but I think because they play so much into it, there's, like, that's, that part in me where I'm like, okay, I'll, I let it go a little bit mm. more than... But, yeah, this one, it just... Because it doesn't even fit... Yeah, it feels I guess, so yeah. like our place. Yeah, true. Yeah, it just feels like they throw in all these components of well, and that's what because with um, uh, 
who was supposed to originally be the be Fergie. Well, I can't think of his name now. Joe Pesci. Uh, yeah, you know, Joe like Pesci. Joe, Joe Pesci was was offered was off the role, or like Stallone wanted Joe yeah. Pesci to be the to be the character. Well, he said he didn't want to do sci-fi, and yep. so, but they chose Rob Schneider just because he w- did comedy. So it's like it still, Stallone went, oh well, he could, he might add a ex- nice little some quips to it or stuff like that. So yeah. It feels like they're just grabbing things and what we've kind of talked about of even imposing um, other sci-fi tropes in it or things like that of, well, this might work and this might work and this and, you know, kind of throwing it all together. <laughs> yeah. It does very much feel like that. And I don't know why, like, yeah, they're just like kind of throwing things into the mix, like left, right and center. And even the way they, they don't even like, um, I'd, like, directly adapt like one story from the comic books but they've just thrown together a whole bunch of different storylines and kind yeah. of mixed them in a blender of like you know the the storyline to do with Rico who we'll get to and then there's a bit of the judge child in there and then there's a bit of you know like it's all yeah. these kind of different kind of you know long running plot lines that are like thrown thrown together in this this kind of mad not very cohesive at all mix. Yeah, and that's what I always felt off about. And what I, I mean, the 2012 version I liked because it was so, it like an introduced us to the character, and it was so self-contained. Of like, here's just this normal crime that they're basically they're taking down a, a drug kingpin. Not to yeah. spoil it for anybody that hasn't watched it yet, you should because it's great. Um, but this one felt like a even watching it now feels like a sequel or something because it's like, it's so high stakes and there's so much to it, but they don't give us enough time to really introduce us to all of these elements. Yeah, for like sure. Maybe if there was a, a one that introduced us, that was like a normal, you know, more like the 2012 plot line. And then this is we'll what shooting. we get later on when we know who Dredd is, when we know who Hershey or whoever, you know, these characters are. Yeah, and kind of expand into the universe. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But um, we should maybe keep trucking yes. with the plot because <laughs> yes. we are we're, we're maybe we're like forty minutes into the episode yes. or something, and, and we're like ten minutes into the film. Yes. <laughs> but we get all the nice kind of because um, it kind of goes by in a blur, or not um, where he sentences Fergie, and that's where we we don't see him again for a while. Yeah. And then we kind of just get just little bits of him being there's um the news broadcast, but there yeah there's so there's several things kind of quickly going through at once where we're getting the news broadcast of the the riots where the you know the anchor is definitely very vocal about the, the issues system. he has, yeah, and especially with judge dread, and then we kind of get them in the the changing room and there's more back and forth and also Judge Dredd has to kind of work with Balthazar Getty or all of these other kind of young kids to teach them that are cadets but they start out as judges start out as children yeah going which in. is again like kind of feeds in a little bit to the satire of like you know they're kind of done up kind of Nazi youth style, you know, it's, it yeah. kind of feeds in a little bit. Yeah. Again, but again, it doesn't really do anything with it. it unlike, yeah. you know, unlike Robocop, which was, you know, interestingly heavily inspired by yes. Judge Dredd itself and meant that they didn't want to do Judge Dredd for years afterwards because they thought the properties would turn out looking too similar. Um, so like, yeah, but you know, it really should have that kind of tone. And, like, yeah. it seems like at the time, like, just Hollywood was very bad at that tone outside of movies directed by Paul Verhoeven. Yeah. Like, he was basically the director. He was your go-to director if you wanted a kind of action satire that, like, mixed these elements and got that tone correct. Because, yeah, yeah like... Otherwise, Hollywood always seemed to be like, no, it has to exist in this box. It's either the serious, violent, dark action sci-fi or it's, you know, light, comedic, you know, buddy cop, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah. It's either one thing or, or, or the other. It can't be this, like, mixture of, like, ultra-violent and but also, like, like funny. And, and it just, 
and again, it's just that thing of like the you know there's plenty of comedy in Judge Dredd's the comics, but just not the comedy that this film wants to press on us. Yeah, but no, I yeah, and that's kind of I know an issue we've talked about throughout the about tone um, throughout the whole both seasons so far. Um, but yeah, I know so for it it just all of these scenes leading up until and it feels like forever until we actually get moving along and get to Rico and to get everything yeah, but it, it does like it we're does feel like these little yeah it does feel tiny, like a little while you know because yeah. everything feels very separate so like yeah. there's these kind of things kind of setting up the plot of like you do you have like a little scene of Judge Griffin who's played by Jürgen Prochnow kind of petitioning the council uh, for like more executions and stuff like that and you're kind of like mm, he might seem like a bad egg uh, yeah. you know like he, he might be uh, one of the villains of the movie guess what um, you know and then yeah and we get like the introduction of, of Rico I, I do like obviously one of the big controversial moments in the movie uh, happens early on I took a note of this because I, I wanted to know precisely when this happened. So, like, um, Dredd takes his helmet off. Yes. Um, and that's one of the big sticking points for, like, all Judge Dredd fans that, like, Stolen spends most of the movie with the helmet off. And to be fair, I, you know, like, Disney's paying him a lot of money and, you know, like, you know, obviously thought it's much more marketable to have his face on display. But it takes him, so Judge Dredd is introduced at the eight minute mark and I timed it, he takes his helmet off at uh, 16 minutes and 30 seconds. So just over eight minutes he has his hel- helmet on <laughs> before he takes it off. And then he doesn't have it on again until like, the very end. <laughs> As he's driving away and the credits are rolling. Ah, uh, dear. But, yeah. But then anyway, we... um. We cut to the Aspen Penal Colony, where we are introduced to uh, Rico, and um, suddenly uh, we're watching uh, Demolition Man. Yeah, <laughs> with Armand Asante, who either knows exactly the type of, mo- type of movie he's in, or is just somebody's having fun with it, and it's a <laughs> he, he is having a lot of fun with it. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it has some of those fun elements where the the guys bringing him the with the the package from their mysterious benefactor. He says, "Oh, what is it?" He goes, "The meaning of life." Oh, oh yeah, whatever. What is the meaning of life? It ends. <laughs> it, it turns into a gun, and he shoots him. And it's like, oh. and he very specifically shoots him through the throat because yeah. there's these guns pointed at him like these machine gun turrets kind of pointed at him but they're like voice controlled so he shoots them through the throat so the the, the warden can't do the kind of voice control and then the, the, the warden gets all shot up by the basically like in robocop where the guy gets all shut up by yeah, the, yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's like lifting a lot of things like, like we should have yeah. mentioned as well like when we get the first shot of mega city one it's like it's kind of li- it's lifting heavily from blade runner so we're getting, yeah. getting some heavy lifts from blade runner we're getting some he- you know heavy lifts from uh robocop and uh yeah we're definitely getting uh we will talk more about all the lifts from Demolition Man yeah, as well yeah. because like the plot is weirdly similar in yeah. a lot of different ways. Yeah, and so yeah, that's another thing where we get Rico that happens, and then he just kind of or then you know two soldier two guards come in and he's able to defeat them, kill them, and then like he disappears for a bit, and then we get more kind of random scenes where we're seeing. I think this is where um this like is where we get yeah, training tra- training the kids and stuff like that. And he's even making jokes and he's like he's very kind of nice teachery to these kids. Again, like it goes against not only the the source material character, which again whatever, but also the character that in the dialogue we are made to believe <laughs> he's supposed to be. Yeah, because, like, he is quite friendly with the kids and stuff yeah. like that. But then, like, the way Hershey reacts to his little, little speech, his little kind of 
motivational speech or, or whatever that, that goes into a bit dark territory. You know, she's like kind of mortified as a, you know, as if he's just been like scolding these kids and like, you know, you know, like really uh, pushing them beyond their limits or, or like, you know, like, uh, like, yeah, it's just the, yeah, the characters react to dread as if he's like this uh, emotionless void and he's just, um, nothing, nothing, penetrates or whatever and he you know he's just he treats everybody kind of offhandedly or, or whatever but like he's, he doesn't really he just yeah. you know like he's a bit surly but like yeah. essentially quite friendly <laughs> he's basically the same character as he was in demolition man yeah, 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 yeah. He's 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 just as quippy as John John Spartan. He has, yeah, yeah. Uh, he he is essentially the same character as he is in Demolition Man. Yeah, which is kind of like yeah, you know, angry tough cop, but you know, with a heart, you know, whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh uh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> and so through all these random scenes, we get um, Rico finds himself back into the the city and he goes to pick up a case that's been left for him at this pawn shop and he finds and not only does he get the case but he also has um there's this giant antique robot that was for um from you know the wars that apparently you can have the robot as a collector but mm-hmm. it has to be um like not usable despite the fact that it can be reprogrammed literally by just pl- plugging in a wire. So whoever did did that didn't plan that out well of, <laughs> you know, deactivating this, you know, war machine. Yeah, that that is that is true. And I do want to mention uh, for uh, British listeners because I think it's worth mentioning because I think it's quite fun. Um, the shop, the kind of pawn shop that he goes into. Um, the owner of that shop, uh, the character of Geiger, is uh, played by Ian Drury. And Ian Drury, um, as, as British listeners may know, uh, was the lead singer of uh, a British uh, post-punk band uh, called um, Ian Drury and the Blockheads. Mm. Um, who, had, who had hits with uh, things like uh, Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick, Reason to be cheerful, part three, and sex and drugs and rock and roll, all of which are quality singles. And, uh, yeah, he made some damn fine music. And the scene, I like the scene a little bit, and he's even giving little jokes. And again, you just get another kind of where Rico quickly says something and then shoots up, where he says the, oh, you shouldn't grab that gun, you know, they'll take your arm off. And so he grabs the gun and goes, oh, well, I guess I must be a cop or I must be a judge. And then that's it. Yeah. Like, that's kind of how his whole, his shtick for a lot of it is. Like, he says something that's like the, uh, says his own little lines to kill people, but does it, you know, opposite of Judge Dredd, where Judge is, Dredd is law related, he's just sinister related. They give us many way, many reasons to know that Rico is a bad guy. <laughs> that is true. And, um, but yeah, I mean, like, the, the film's very, very deliberately doing that, kind of like, oh, there is like mirror images of each other, which might come into the plot later. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna keep showing their very bright blue eyes. There's yes, many shots indeed. of that. Indeed. Oh, indeed. They both indeed. have very bright blue eyes. <laughs> Could there be a connection there? Mm. Uh, so, uh, yeah. But yeah, so he, he like reactivates the, the ABC warrior, which is, you know, which is a character in the, in the comics, you know, like, um, ABC warrior, like, um, the characters in the comics, Hammerstein. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, and then, yeah, that's when he has, like, th- this is basically when the satire of the movie kind of ends. Yeah. <laughs> of, like, we've had, like, these little bits of satire, and there's this whole, there's all this whole kind of subplot of this reporter, uh, Vartis Hammond, uh, who is, yeah, like, this investigative reporter, very down on the whole judge system, kind of wants to take the system down, it seems, and it seems like he's maybe going to be, an important character, a la <laughs> Edgar Friendly in uh, Demolition Man. However, no, that that does not happen. He is no. immediately assassinated, and by somebody dressed in Dread's gear. And yeah, 
and the person busts in, shoots it up, and a camera catches it all. And yeah, and then Judge Dredd is going on another, or no, Hershey is handling just a traffic violation, which Dredd helps out about, where this kind of jerk guy is, you know, wanting to deal with, uh, or he's driving his fancy car and he's bumping all these other cars. And so he's being rude to Hershey and, but then when he sees Dread, which it doesn't make sense fully because there's parts where it's like everybody in the city knows Dread specifically, but then there's parts where it seems like they don't. I don't know. Or it's just because of the name Dread itself it sounds terrifying, but yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think so. And like, yeah, I mean, this scene kind of doesn't make sense as well because like, in you know, I, even ignoring the comics, right? Yeah, we've kind of set up this world where you know it is this kind of fascistic regime. So everybody's under this kind of boot of oppression of the judge system. Yeah, then everybody knows that it is this kind of super severe law and order system. So it kind of doesn't make sense that this asshole yuppie guy who, apart from being an asshole yuppie guy, apparently does have quite good taste in music because they, <laughs> with, with his companion in the car, they're listening to Supercharger Heaven uh, by White Zombie. So yeah. fair play to him on that regard. But anyway, he tries to bribe Hershey, which I just, it, it doesn't feel like it makes sense within yeah. the universe that's been set up of just being like, oh, it's this, harsh disciplinarian society so but like why would he think he would get away with that yeah no i agree because it just doesn't it just feels like they added it in for a point for like to either show more connection between hershey and dread like that's the only purpose of it and to show how dread is coming in and kind of helping her and saving the day when I mean, she doesn't even really necessarily need need his help at all. She was no, handling the really. situation. Yeah. <laughs> all he did was almost make things. He just worse escalated by, blow, yeah, by blowing up the car. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get like another uh, one liner. I can't remember specifically what he says now. Actually, we get another one one liner about yeah. enjoy driving or something. Or, or yeah. Like, um, but it's there so that the other police that aren't judges <laughs> that either are or something they're dressed up differently. They're not street judges, I guess. The yeah, other they're police, a different type of like yeah. The stormtroopers as we'll call them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they can come up and say that Judge Dredd is under arrest. And he's pretty kinda calm about it. And yeah, and then we can we go into um we don't go right into the the trial because isn't that where we get Rico meeting Griffin? Or did that happen? No, Rico hasn't point. met Griffin. No, okay. like we've not made that connection yet. No, 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 no. Okay. Like um, that that doesn't that doesn't happen for a little like um no, I don't think uh, Rico and, and Griffin like meet up at this point. Like we okay. get like a little scene where Chief Fargo played by um Max von Sydow. Yes. They, he has like a little man to man with Dredd when he's in the, the holding cell before they, we then go into the the trial. Yeah, and he's saying, I just wanted to look into your eyes to see if you're telling the truth. And obviously Judge Dredd would never break the law, so he knows he's not lying to him. Or at least he thinks he isn't. Yeah. Oh, he, he then, I suppose there is DNA evidence, so like he yeah. b- believes it. Um, yeah. But, uh, so yeah, we get we get this trial. Initially, there's a there's a video showing Dread doing it, but then that is seen as inadmissible because one of the younger students with his techie knowledge is like, oh well, it could be faked, you know, we, the the you know the uniform could be faked, badges can be faked, and we can't get a clear look at his face; it's too low res. So that's thrown out. But then we get this DNA evidence that shows that only. Uh, the judge who has the, who has the gun can can uh, you know that basically there is DNA on each bullet of the gun called the lawgiver, uh, the lawgiver two, and um, that proves indisputably that Dread killed the reporter Vardis Hammond and his wife Mrs Hammond, and Dread who is supposed to have no emotion then has his whole yell. Of that, his lies, 
I didn't break the law. I am the law. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, the guy that has shows no emotion. He yeah. has a whole upset in court. But, yeah. <laughs> and this is also kind of when we get the first talk of the the genius project. And we don't, at this point, we're like, oh, well, that's going to come up in the plot later. But, like, <laughs> what's the genius project? Um, and uh, we, we, like, basically, yes, at this point, it's not fully been revealed that uh, Griffin, uh, Jurgen Prochnow's character, is one of the villains of the movie, but it's been, it's been kind of like, yeah, he's definitely one of the villains of the yeah, movie. It's you know, very, he's, he's introduced as yeah. like, we should definitely execute more people. And then he's yeah. like, oh, Judge Fargo, like maybe, uh, <laughs> you know, like giving him kind of dodgy advice. So like, um, we're like, ah, oh, yes, okay. Yeah, definitely yeah. villain. They do not pepper it or anything. <laughs> they make yeah, it very it's not like clear. a grand review or anything of like, oh, that guy? <laughs> Fucking hell. Oh, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> and so he is also convincing um, the chief judge to say, well, what you could do is you take the long walk. And by doing that, you would almost save dread from execution because you think of dread like a son. All that and the long long walk is you know judges that reach a certain age, or once you reach a certain age as a judge and you're retiring, you get basically cast out into the the scorched earth or the the cursed yeah. earth. Yeah, cursed earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. So it's a yes because Dredd mentioned this earlier on in the movie that that's that's how judges retire. That like um you get you get old if you get old if you're not killed on duty. Then you retire by wandering out into the cursed earth, which is just like the the rest of the kind of earth outside the mega the cities, cities are, yeah. are just kind of like these, um, yeah, just desert wastelands, basically. Yeah, and it's basically like a Mad Max thing for anybody that. Yeah, it is basically yeah. like like a, like a Mad. This this movie is ripping off all sorts of things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, yeah, their whole goal is, well, what they're told is to go give or to go bring law to the lawless lands and stuff like that. Yeah. And so he retires and basically sacrifices himself in a way to at least save Dredd, which gives Dredd a, a lifelong sentence in the Aspen uh, prison. And then... So it does this back and forth while we're seeing Dredd get stripped and get, you know, his muscles showing <laughs> and <laughs> all of that. And is and then um the Chief Justice being honored. So one's being losing everything, one's kind of having this honorable exit and the but yeah, they're both true. Thing out. Yeah. I suppose we should mention that in this movie, unlike um a lot of the movies we covered, um we do not get any uh, naked butt shots um, that nope. <laughs> we've got in uh, several of the previous movies, uh, but we do get um, a couple of times where uh, Stallone is in a very tight leotard. So, yep. like, <laughs> we do, yes. And they make sh- this one sh- makes sure to show the shoulders a lot because he's wearing the tank top the whole time, and it's one where it's like it it only has the small strip up the back or whatever. So that's true. His muscles. That's true. And it's it's kind of big. Or like when he is in his full uniform, like the big over the top kind of gold gold uh, gold shoulder pads, and and the way it's is designed. Apparently designed by Yanni Versace. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, there you go. Um, but then we get, we get. But this is when we get the big reveal that oh my god. Griffin's the bad guy. Um, <laughs> like um, so, yes. After like it sent her in the long walk, Dred's been sent out to Yale. Griffin is now he's now uh, Chief Justice. Although in the comics they're just called Chief Judge. Like I don't yeah. know why they changed. I don't know why they both changed that. I don't know, it seems like the weirdest thing. But anyway, he becomes Chief Justice, and then it is revealed that like he is the guy who's been orchestrating things all along. <laughs> He's the one who got Rico out of jail, and we we get a very and basically um he's kind of he, he kind of feels gutted. He's like, ah, oh, maybe we should have got Dread on board, you know, and um 
Because but, he would have been, he's like our best cop. So. Yeah. But, uh, like, as in a lot of scenes, Armand Asante is just very entertaining. <laughs> like, he, he's just, he's not chewing the scenery. He's got the knife and fork out and he is just devouring yeah. the, the, the scenery. Like, and, there, and there's some great lines in this one, you know, this one particular scene. So at one point he says, forget dread, he only worships law. And then, <laughs> and then, and then, um, and then he's, uh, Judge Griffin is talking about like, hey, wanting to, to create, to create fear and chaos within, as much fear and chaos within Mega City as possible, um, to kind of enact his plan, um, which we'll go into greater detail as the plot reveals it. And then Armand Asante says, you want fear? I am fear. You want chaos? I am chaos. You want a new beginning? I am the new beginning. I don't know what I even mean. Yeah. <laughs> like that last one's just like, what, what do you mean you're the new beginning? Yeah. What's, I don't, yeah. what? I mean, it sounds entertaining when you say it, but like, it doesn't seem to have a lot of logic to it. Yeah. Well, it, I don't, this one more than uh, we've talked about with so many of these dread, um, or not dread, these, so many of these Stallone villains. It's like there's always that one, even they're cranked up to like 11. He is like cranked up to 25 on a 10, you know, on this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, like you can, you can see like the, the like the veins like popping yeah. the side of the side of his head and all that. There's kind of, it's like, I mean, he is acting his absolute goddamn socks off. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> He earned that paycheck. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I mean, like, I'm not going to make any aspersions on the man. I'm going to assume that the performance uh, was done sober. But, like, if any performance <laughs> looks cocaine fueled, that is. A <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, if that is Armin DeSanti without cocaine, well, so never give <laughs> Armin the sound. Yeah. Oh, but, but the movie is better for it, at least. For Although, the, yeah, yeah, because he is one of the most entertaining like uh, elements of the movie for sure. Yeah. And so next up, we have um, we see Dread, and he's basically walking up to the shuttle that w- it will take him to prison, and he ends up being right next to um, everybody's Rob, favorite yeah. character, <laughs> <laughs> Fergie, aka Rob Schneider. And they're sitting next to each other because obviously the script wants that to happen. And Rob Schneider, you know, makes a comment about it and knowing who he is. And then, um, some, another prisoner right behind them gets wind. And that prisoner isn't too happy because Dread must have locked him up too. Yeah. And, and then that, 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 that causes great mayhem. Although. Yep. Uh, then we are introduced to the, the angel gang who plan to shoot down the prison transport shuttle. Yes. And, you know, they're just your standard wasteland gang where it's clear that they're like, they're hillbillies and they have all of the, the tropes that come with any sort of wasteland <laughs> gang in any kind of Mad Maxy like movie that are deformed and stuff like that i mean there's yeah. there's definitely in this section there's definitely a kind of heavy um hills of eyes yes yeah. as well yes and they well during so while they're watching this and they're very religious too they well they found their version of god out there in the wasteland and there's the prisoner who's able to kind of break free of his shackles and he's trying to stab Dread in the throat, saying, "Pay back, Tom Dread," and he's holding it to him. And so that's going on as there's basically a rocket being fired at the ship to bring it down. And the rocket is fired by Junior Angel, who is um, like uh, because because I you know like um, I am recording this from Edinburgh, so I'm legally obligated uh, by the Scottish government to mention any Scottish actor uh, in any podcast. Spud, bro, yeah. <laughs> so it is played by Ewan Bremner, who um, would the very next year have his big breakout role as um, Spud. In yep. uh, train spotting, just thought I just thought I'd throw that in, um, you know, like uh, 
that's 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 the law in Scotland. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Just Which, kidding. <laughs> obviously, you know, train spotting is significantly <laughs> better than this movie, but yeah. Yeah. But um anyway, I, I just I just thought it through that. It's interesting as well, because the Angel Gang is main, like played mainly by British actors, like uh, Christopher Adamson, who's played various deformed villains in various Blockbusters, and also a movie we talked about in the Guilty Pleasure series of, of my podcast, New Horror Express: uh, Evil Aliens. Uh, he was, he was oh, yeah, I was on that one. Yeah. Uh, yes, I know. I know that's yep. why I brought it up. <laughs> 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 but uh, Pie Angel is is not played uh, by a British actor. The rest of them are. Um, is played by Scott Wilson, who would go on to be most famous for playing Herschel in The Walking Dead. I would say. Yeah. And he's been in, yeah, I was trying to, because I remembered him from that, and I, but yeah, he's one of those faces that has kind of, he's been around for years. And you, yeah, you know, for and, sure, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. And so they're brought down, and then we're, we basically are jumping into, um, one Hershey is kind of continuing on her investigation. Uh, and looking at the locker, and she finds pictures, a picture of, dread as a baby and his parents potentially and then there's also another picture of him shaking hands and being buddy buddy with a person who she can only assume is his only friend because before he suggested he only has had one friend but he had to judge him so maybe that was foreshadowing for this Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And then throughout that, then we also get, um, Griffin is told, or it's communicated that the ship was brought down and that they're scoping it out and that Dread is no longer, wasn't on board. And Griffin keeps saying that there were no survivors. And, you know, a soldier's like, we found a, the pilot. He's alive. There were no survivors. And they get that message and the pilot's yeah. like, what the fuck? I thought I was going to get yeah. saved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, then we basically we get to meet the Angel Gang a little bit, bit closer up as Rob Schneider, Fergie, and <laughs> Judge Dredd are basically hanging from ropes in this you know barn looking thing. Even though it's not even a barn, it's an abandoned building, but yeah, um, it's kind of half underground and everything that comes with you know nuclear fallout. I assume if we were in one. <laughs> Yeah. And you know, that's when we kind of we meet them, they're talking about the Lord, and then you're really introduced, but more so that Dread already knew about all of them. He's heard about the Angel Gang, so he introduces or gives us the MO on all of them. And oh, um, yeah, of their yeah. crimes. Like yeah. um Pi Angel gives us like fun introductions of like and this is my youngest, and this is my, you know, like, and here's Mean Machine. We call this one Mean Machine. He yeah. has some, um, you know, things, you know, you know it's very and tough he, out here in the coast there. And <laughs> yeah. And he cranks up his, um, like, head knob thing. I guess that makes Yeah, he's got like impressive. a, he's got like a kind of dial, uh, in the middle of his forehead that kind of turns up his aggressiveness somehow. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, so it ends up doing, they do that, and, but Dread, it feels like he kind of stops because maybe he left out one of their crimes, but I don't know. We might see. But obviously Fergie starts, you know, praising the Lord and, you know, saying, and they're like, oh, we got ourselves another believer, you know, and, you know, in their kind of really bad Southern accents. (laughs) <laughs> the stereotype, and so they take off Fergie, and Dread That's keeps true. saying, "Oh, I think like Scott Wilson is actually from like Georgia or something." Yeah, I think, but I mean, the rest of them are British actors, but like yeah. at least you know, like, um, I, 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 yeah, I don't know. Yeah, apparently he was born in uh, Thomasville, Georgia. There so we go. At least there is one one actor of the yeah. gang who is actually from the south. Yeah. And his, yeah, his works. But I mean, we get some of those, those very 
a kind of southern accents. They're like, "Hey, Paul," you know. That, <laughs> You're, well, you got like a Scotsman and two Englishmen yeah. doing it. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it's essentially just like me being like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, and so um, Dredd keeps warning Fergie saying, you know, you're making a big mistake. And you're obviously Fergie's cocky of, no, Dredd, I'm not making a mistake. The only one is you're still up there and I'm right here. And that's when Dredd remembers there was another crime that they commit cannibalism i mean i think he always remembered i think he was just yeah, like yeah. uh being a dick yeah. <laughs> yeah, i mean that is kind of why would you wait until the guy is off the rope and all that to say it like, i know is, it's yeah, like just, i want to see him really sweat when i make this reveal that he is about to be eaten yeah, and then kind of like um, obviously you know we discussed that this uh, film was submitted a bunch of times to the MPA, mm-hmm. and uh, this is kind of like the grisliest moment of the movies because we do see yeah. a guy who's like on a spit roast who's obviously already been cooked. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what's interesting hearing that kind of information from you about that because thinking about the movie now. And even when I was watching it, it's like there isn't that much. I mean, there's some a little bit of blood here and there, but it's not really that. The violence isn't extreme enough to for me to think it would get a like an NC-17 rating for four times. I don't know. Yeah, well, I, I presume the opening scene's bloodier. I presume yeah. the death of the warden's bloodier. Yeah. There's scenes later on in the movie that there's like weird edits on that we'll talk about when they come up. Um, like where I assume it was nastier, uh, but it's kind of kind of cut. Yeah. But I so then he is able to get Dread is able to get off of the his hook or whatever, and he you know beats up the guys and he kills them all and he turns down the dial on the one and you think okay well they're they're practically all done but no then the the storm troop i mean the other <laughs> judges the other judges aren't, whatever they're called <laughs> yeah, that definitely aren't stormtroopers they come in because they have to end dread and so it like goes from a fight with that family right into a fight with them but dread is saved by the last one by a certain Justice, also our chief judge, who may have already been wandering the wasteland. <laughs> dun dun dun! It's yeah. the return of former Chief Justice Fargo, played by Max von Sydow. Yeah. But not long, even though they're happy to see each other. Um, he instantly gets um, impaled by the. Yeah, the one with the... Mean Machine. Yeah, in mean Machine, there we go. Yeah, Mean Machine, who then... And this is another thing that's popped up several times in Stallone's um, movies, and I realize this you know, maybe because we've been watching them so close together, where he does the three-strike thing, and there seems to be a fight that Stallone has in all of these movies where the guy is almost egging him on. You know, you have the... Um, the wrong answer section and cliffhanger. There's yeah. one in um, Demolition Man. So this one is the you get three strikes and so strike one, strike two, and then he hits him in the head with this metal bar and it doesn't do anything. He says strike three, but that seems to be a common thing. Yeah, in yeah, yeah. In these Stallone movies. Yeah, yeah. It seems to be a where, definite yeah. thread where it's like, yeah. oh yeah, we get like uh, one character who seems like semi-invincible that uh, goads Stallone and then Stallone beats him at the, the last second kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And this, you know, obviously we get more, that he slams his hand or he shoves his hand into a wall and it gets stuck because of the like spikes and everything. He basically has like yeah. yeah, he has this like metal arm, and he's at the end of the arm, he's got this kind of Swiss Army knife kind of uh, yeah. with various <laughs> sharp, pointy things. Yeah. Um, you know, like, uh, yeah. And Dread does the whole. He's giving a charge of using illegal electricity. How do you plead? And the guy kind of yells, 
He says, I know, I knew you'd say that. And he electrocutes them. And, you know, because we need more of the, I knew you'd say that. Yeah, I knew you'd yeah. say that. They're like, that is that, that classic Judge Dredd uh, catchphrase. Yeah. But then basically everybody kind of finds out Dredd's origins or kind of, yeah, time, like yeah. at the same, at the same time, Hershey's investigation kind of shows that the picture with the parents is a fake and like he's actually when you take the 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 parents out of the image like the image the, the only true parts of the image are the baby in the image and then it's just like this laboratory and then we get this kind of big exposition dump uh, from chief former chief justice fargo as yeah. he's dying um and um he, he takes a while to die like it looks like yeah. <laughs> when he's impaled initially that he is dead that yeah. he is he has been killed by that but actually he's not being killed he he is uh he has enough time to give like a kind of 10 minute monologue of being like yeah. <laughs> here are your origins and yeah. like you were born in the lab and uh Rico is your brother because he is made from the same DNA, which is actually my DNA. Um, so, uh, like, so I am technically your father. We're having a Star Wars moment. Uh, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they had enough time to like make a fire. They put a blanket over him. So this wasn't like it's been. He's been dying for some time now. <laughs> yeah, he's been dying for like for like hours. Yeah, and then. But again, you know, like dreads, no emotion dreads. Yeah. You know, like when he dies, he's all like, no. Yeah. And then, you know, like, uh, and then we get him kind of like staring brutally at this Lady Law statue, you know, yeah. and it, it, again, just feels full of him, brimming with emotion. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they talk about law in such a way that they're kind of, Again, it's not, it's the opposite, I guess, of how the law works in, um, in the comic itself, where in this one they're talking about how the law is so just and basically, I don't know. They talk about with more, like, sentiment. This is very, yeah. it's very, it's very sentimental kind of, uh, you know, uh, what they talk of, of the law and, uh, you know, how, how generally good it is. But, um, apart from when it kind of, We've all oh, overextended ourselves a bit sometimes, but essentially it's, you know, at its heart, it's real decent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and this is where um, the attack on the judges start beginning. Yes. Uh, oh, and we also yeah. get the introduction of um, Joan, Ken- Joan Chen's character, uh Ilsa, um, or Dr. Hayden, um, which I, I don't know. Like, it seems weird to introduce a, ca- a character so like this I, an I, hour into the film. It feels like she should have been introduced maybe earlier. Um, but it's like, oh, like we've got this female Dr. Frankenstein character. Um, sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't like Rico. They kind of have a, they, back and forth but yeah that's what he calls like, him a petulant <laughs> child yeah but yet there's some probably some sexual tension they make it clear but no i'd agree i'd agree completely watching it it's like this is somebody that it seems like they would have even brought her on when we first meet rico like she's the one that was collecting or something it just it feels like she was just thrown in last minute and then they kind of have this connection with each other that you know then goes rapid speed because they really only have what uh, two scenes together before it's like oh so now they're like oh okay. now they're like a <laughs> couple sure okay yeah it's it's just uh i don't know it's kind of, it's just kind of weird it, it is yeah it's just kind of weird but then yeah i mean we basically get like a, a montage of like all the judges being attacked, we we get a big explosion at a bank. We get uh, the changing room, at the you know like the precinct exploding. Um, then we get the ABC warrior killing a, a bunch of folk. Um, uh, Hershey's bike blows up, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, there's all these there's all these attacks on the judges, and then this is when Griffin makes his big move to have the uh, 
to have the genius project for, you know, which has been making clones, made the clones, it made Judge Dredd and Rico, as we discovered, to, to have that uh, reinstated. Um, which but the, those other judges don't, still don't want it and it doesn't work for them, so they get, they get offed. <laughs> Yeah, right. Like, uh, are the those are chief judges? I guess. Yeah, the 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 chief the the other chief judges, the other the council, like, ma- count, council, yeah, the other members of the council, um, who are like, I don't, it, it's played weird in the movie. Of it's like Judge Griffin's like, oh, we should definitely unlock the files on the Janus project, and they're like, yeah, sure, maybe we should do that. And then immediately, two seconds yeah. after, they're like, no, we definitely shouldn't do that. We immediately regret our decision. It's like, yeah. oh, this feels kind of... Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it, yeah, it feels like it's just added lines. Almost, I don't know. <laughs> or maybe there was supposed to be a longer scene in between and they just forgot to cut out some of it. Yeah, but anyway, we'll... we'll uh, We'll leave it be. This is yeah. so. <laughs> There's more logic defying stuff coming up, so yeah. um, we'll we'll we'll, 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 we'll continue on. So um, yeah, so Dread and Fergie are find out that or Dread knows that there's a way back into Mega City if they are to run through this tunnel that shoots out fire every thirty seconds. Yeah, and um. You know, obviously this is where Fergie is supposed to, there, it becomes kind of a buddy movie, I guess. Yeah, okay, okay. Kind of. Because he, um, you know, he obviously doesn't want to go. And they have some little back and forth, but finally they start running through and they're able to get, and Dread even saves them and they're able to get back into Mega City. Like yeah. Running oh, through a the fun tunnel. story about this. Apparently, according to Rob Schneider in, in an interview, uh, Stone was given uh, lots of kind of flame retardant clothing, and Schneider was given nothing. <laughs> really? Yeah, apparently so. Well, according according yeah. to him, like um, in in an interview, that's, and that's what he said. And Schneider's the one that ends up being he's supposed to be closer to the fire too. It's the fight. He's the one of more danger. <laughs> so to be fair, as much as I hate this character in this movie, um, you know, like he, you know, I feel sorry for him in that regard. Yeah. There is a, a later scene as well. You know, like the scene later where he's like running downstairs. Yeah. He like he like um, you see it in the making of. The little um, making of video, the, the documentary that you can see on YouTube, um, that was made at the time. He like, he falls and like face plants, um, Jeez. and like really quite, like, quite badly injures his ankle, um, running down those stairs. Like the first time, the first take they did it, he like just tripped and like it. It's uh, you should watch it. It's like I will. it doesn't. It's quite a nasty London, and, and it, was, it was like, oh man, Rob Schneider didn't uh, didn't have the, the greatest of times in terms of <laughs> in terms of hurting himself in this movie. And in his mind, it's probably like I'm just coming, up, or I'm almost off of SNL. Or I just came off of SNL. Like I'm gonna, this is gonna be it for me. It's really gonna change everything around. Yeah, 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 yeah. This big budget project, what could go wrong, man? It's going to be a massive blockbuster. It's going to make me. Uh, (laughs) But they do manage to get into the city. They manage to avoid that fireball. And thankfully, you know, uh, we we can say that um, they manage to avoid the fireball in real life. (laughs) And, uh, you know, and uh, Rob Schneider has stayed stayed intact to this day. Yeah. (laughs) And so they go to Hershey where they kind of get more exposition of what we've already seen. Yeah. And um, Hershey is first, at first she's kind of not sure about Judge Dredd, but obviously that changes within a couple of seconds because, you know, the script says so. And then, uh, yeah, they talk about kind of what is the, the plan is going to be to break in and kind of bring justice to to these wrongdoers and and then during that time Rob Schneider or Fergie is also 
he's working on um, some device because he's a hacker and he's trying to yeah reroute. So, like, before yeah. before we get to like Hershey's apartment, like that is where we get like the because they, they first go into the halls of justice and stuff. Oh yeah, and yep. they're like um, yeah. yeah, and then he like nicks dread nicks a uniform uh, from from a guy, and um, then there's like this kind of weird homophobic moment where it's kind of a <laughs> It's made to look like Stallone's going to basically rape the guy, and like um, this is, and Fergie's like, "Oh, there's no time for this," and it's like he just looks at him as if being like, "Were you mental? I'm obviously not going to rape this guy." <laughs> yeah. And it's like it's just like it's just a really weird off yeah. moment. Um, but then, but yeah, they, then uh, we kind of get like a. Uh, a chase scene and they're, they're like running through the halls and I think that's where he like falls over and um, then we get like this whole kind of um, chase on the, the, the wall master bikes we get this uh, which is it was a good action set piece we should yeah. probably mention it just because of that of like it's really good action set piece of, of like the, the the wall master bike chase yeah um, uh, before uh, we, we land at uh, Hershey's yeah. apartment no, that one, it works really well. And yeah, and there's kind of, there, you get this lawmaster that has been malfunctioning, it's seen malfunctioning early on, it's like a test one for the cadets, and then, so it'll keep going off and on while they're doing this, through these high-speed chase through the city, and yeah, it, it's fun. The thing that gets you is you kind of hear <laughs> Perky screaming the whole time. Yeah, that's that like, kind of okay. annoying. Yeah, but you know, and then there's like Dread jumping onto the other one to fight one of the guys, and they're you know they're flying over people, and yeah, it works really well. And I think again, even for um, the year it came out, I think it still looks pretty decent. Yeah, I, I think so. Like special I mean, yeah. effects, why? I mean, like the, the film is now uh, coming up for twenty six years old, and um, yeah, that's, I think it looks some pretty pretty solid, pretty pretty yeah. decent. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, like again, I think uh, kind of intercutting with this is like we get a bit more of Rico, and um, yeah, so. The, the doctor character, Joan Chen's character, who I do feel sorry for. Like the, you know, we've covered two movies that have featured Joan Chen and in both she has been entirely wasted and yeah. given no material to work with. So she's really facing an uphill struggle. Um, in case listeners don't remember, uh, the other movie that featuring Joan Chen was, of course, the Steven Seagal film on deadly ground. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> poor Joan Chen. Um, you know, on Deadly Ground came out in ninety four, this came out in ninety five. That's just she deserved better. Yeah. And she's good too. It's just yeah, I agree completely that she's just got nothing to work yeah, with. Yeah. <laughs> like they bring her in at the last bit and say, Okay, kind of be a rude doctor. But now you're not being a rude doctor, now you're like his love interest. Slash yeah, because like, woman or something. I don't know. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, like they're like a partnership now. It's yeah. like, oh, we get one scene where she's calling him a petulant child, and then we get a scene of like he switches what the DNA sample for the clones are going to be, yeah. and then suddenly it's like, oh, they're like a couple. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> because he he just says, you know, I had to I had to work for Griffin because I was. He got me when I was in in prison, so I didn't have a choice. But what's your excuse? And that's what changes her instantly, <laughs> I guess. For sure, that's just like, oh, that argument is entirely sound. I am yeah. now by your side. I, I also love, like, when we cut back to Hershey's, like, apartment, like, we get a scene where, again, we, we're, we're talking about Dred's lack of emotion He's like talking about no feelings, no emotion, and yet he's on the bed and he's practically crying. He's like, yeah. you know, <laughs> I, you know, and I don't mind vulnerability in my heroes, but you know, it's just like it's not the character. Like, you know, stop telling us he has no feelings and no emotions when that is not what is on screen. 
Yeah. Well, and even for the sake of of Fergie, he's one of those characters where, you know, normally in these buddy movies, they're stuck together for some reason. That's yeah. why they can't separate or there's something driving them both to go that certain way, whatever it may be. This one, it doesn't feel like you're kind of wondering, well, why are you still with Dread? I mean, it just it doesn't feel like there's any reason for them to be together besides the plot told them, you know, because the script told them to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I I agree with that. Like, yeah. uh, Fergie's kind of like, I mean, I suppose he's kind of sticking by Dread because... Because he saved him. Because he saved him and because maybe he thinks that Dread can, like, uh, if he helps him then Dread will officially clear his name because maybe he's worried about still being a fugitive. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best logic I can give you Craig you know like yeah. what do you want <laughs> yeah I guess that's it <laughs> but we uh, put more thought into it than <laughs> obviously the script I tried my best Craig yeah. uh, I wanted to give you some logic you know like uh, something you can hold on to but that's all I got <laughs> so but yeah when they're in there he so they kind of realize that there's was a power, there's something, there was a major power surge, and so they're kind of pinpointing where the this project, yeah. Yeah. And so that's where they must be, um, Griffin and um, Rico and all. But just like in Demolition Man, Rico turns on Griffin. Yep. And he, because Griffin is upset that Rico put in his own blood, Rico's saying, well, I don't want any. Like mindless, basically mindless drones falling around. I want them to be free thinkers and that. And then, yeah, the ABC robot, it grabs Griffin. And even though we don't see it, it, we are told that it's going to rip his arms off, his legs off and save his head for last. Yeah. So I name, like, Queenie does rip his arms off, like, the camera, like, uh, pans down and we just see a little bit of a kind of pool of blood. Yeah. On the floor, um, but I, I, it, this does definitely feel like one of those moments that has been edited. I, I presume yeah. in the original canon cut, hashtag release the canon cut, um, yeah. well, <laughs> um, that uh, we, we get to see him rip his arms off. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. Uh, yeah. And... There's there's a few other moments kind of in the scene. Like I do know that this kind of finale was kind of edited down quite heavily. Yeah. Cause there there was apparently like uh, sequences where you just see like uh, dread, like shooting up the clones and all that kind of stuff. Um. So it does seem like there. And when you watch it, it does feel quite jumpy. It just kind of yeah. it feels oddly edited. It feels kind of like there is stuff missing. You know, like, oh, what's... What? Yeah, because there's a, yeah. there's a whole section where Rico tells the computer he wants the clones to be hatched now. It says, oh, they're only at 60%. says, well, I need backup. Hatch them now, basically overriding it. But then they don't even really... You'd see maybe an arm pop up from one of them or one of them lift up, but that's it. It's not like they officially hatched to really provide backup assistance. So it just seemed, I don't know. And it yeah. ends up being pointless, basically. It, it does end up being pointless, but apparently, the, the, like, Dread did have, like, a kind of battle with them, you know, when uh, in, the original, in the original cut. There is, like, yeah. more of an interaction there. And it's kind of not explained, like... Like basically, um, I suppose we should we should mention like uh, Fergie gets like shot by the ABC warrior, and and then uh, here she is uh, briefly kind of captured by it, and um, but then uh, Fergie manages to hack the ABC warrior, and and then there's this this kind of big fight between Rico and Dread, and then there's this big fight between Hershey and um, uh, Ilsa. Uh, yeah, which, uh, which George, Hershey is a you know, a highly trained cop, or, well, judge, and, you know, Ilsa. 
apparently just the scientists, just yeah. the kind of wacky <laughs> Dr. Frankenstein style scientists. Who can hold up up. But yeah, but apparently he's also got some martial arts skills. Um, so, um, which kind of just feels like Hollywood racism. <laughs> like, yeah. well, this Asian woman, I'm sure she knows martial arts. Um, <laughs> That's not the. It's not the first time that it's popped up on this podcast so far. Like, <laughs> no. oh, we have an Asian character, so <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> I know. Have to have martial arts. Uh, yeah, that is the problem of uh, running a '90s action podcast. You know, it's like we shall encounter more Hollywood racism as, as yeah. going forward. Um, I, I am sure we've already encountered some. It's it's just something we have to recognize and and deal with it you know as much as we love a lot of these movies um so they have some problematic elements um a bunch of them (laughs) very much uh but um but i mean like the sort like a kind of alright fight it actually like um the fight between her and uh hersey is is almost better than the fight between rico and dread i think like yeah feels quite impactful Particularly when, like, Diane Lee just headbutts her. Yeah. And then, because she calls her, uh, bitch, and she's like, that's Judge Bitch. <laughs> just headbutts her. It's amazing. Yeah. And so, apparently, again, in the kind of making of video, um, like, that was a stunt double for Joan okay. Chen, but that was actual Diane Lee. Diane Lee oh, wanted wow. to do her own stunts. So that's actual Diane Lane um, delivering that headbutt. So get on her. Yeah. No, and, and yeah, it does work. That's what, I don't know, the fact that you're talking more and more about how much was cut from it, yeah, it just, especially watching it now after all these years, it is very underwhelmed, just in general. The, the whole thing, the whole fight just kind of feels like it goes by in a blur. And, it's true. Yeah. And like, it just, like from a, a kind of watching point of view, it doesn't. It kind of doesn't feel like it makes sense either. Yeah. Like yeah. when when the lab suddenly starts exploding, you're not quite sure how that happened. Like yeah. there wasn't something. It wasn't like a bomb that went off necessarily. It just seems to start falling apart of its own accord. And you're yeah. like, yeah, I suppose there was some shooting and stuff. Like I'm not. I feel like there's stuff missing which there actually is yeah no that makes more sense and yeah the fight and the whole setup this is where um the demolition man section i mean it's basically ripped right from the final fight of demolition man minus you know the freezing liquid (laughs) yeah but we we do get this yeah final fight uh, inside the head of the Statue of Liberty. Which is, yeah, it's a fun image, you know. Yeah, this is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I, but like yeah, as we've mentioned, like there is all these kind of different moments that are just kind of ripped from like Demolition Man in terms of like Judge Griffin's motivation is very similar to Nigel Hawthorne's character and um, Demolition Man in terms of like rebuilding society in his own image, the betrayal of the villain by the, the you know, the other villain, the other psychopath that he set free, um, the, the whole, the, the way he's kind of set free in this and having this kind of, uh, kind of, uh, Tense conversation with the warden character. That's that feels very similar. The, the, the end feels very similar. There's all sorts of kind of parallels to Demolition Man. Even even down to like one of the weirdest parallels is the voice of the computer in yeah. uh, Demolition Man of like kind of central computer in Demolition Man and the voice of the Hall of Justice central computer in this movie. In yeah. both cases. Uh, the voice is Adrian Barbeau, which is just yeah. like a kind of weird random connection, but like, yeah, it's, um, uh, so yeah, there's a lot of Demolition Man DNA in this movie. Yeah. And, but we did forget right before the fight, so Rico is trying to convince Dredd, you know, let's create a new world and. Oh, yes. That, comes, that, and that, then, that, that is true. We cannot, we cannot have this podcast and not yeah. talk about the greatest exchange of dialogue <laughs> in the movie 
That is a fair point, Craig. Yeah. Where, you know, Dredd obviously mentions it being against the law and, you know, they, they don't follow the law. And Rico's upset because, you know, Dredd's been following this and it's just a puppet. So he does, and it's you know, the biggest part of the whole movie where he goes, law. <laughs> and then he's, you know, he's making fun of, or, you know, criticizing Dredd for his blind faith in the law. <laughs> it's a, it's amazing. It's amazing. No matter how much energy I could put in me making fun of it, it'll still never ever reach the level of theatrics that <laughs> Armand Asante <laughs> puts into it. Oh dear! I just, I mean, I love. I, I think I, I, I need to read out the exchange because it's just so yeah. fun. Like, yeah. so Rico says, "Why did you judge me?" Why did you judge me? Judge Dredd says, you killed innocent people. A means to an end, Rico says. Judge Dredd, you started a massacre. I caused a revolution. You betrayed the law. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's like, it makes the whole movie totally worth it. <laughs> yeah. He discusses how their fam. he was, I'm your friend. I was your blood. We're family. We're the only, you know, family that we have. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but they're <laughs> so kind of jumping around. Their fight seemed weird because it shows Stallone. I know this happens a lot in action movies where you have like the hero who's really ripped, and then he's fighting the final guy, and it's just kind of you're like, wait, well, they're not evenly matched. But that's mm-hmm. one where I. You can definitely see it where, you know, it shows Stallone and his tank top and all of his muscle. And then, um, Rico Asante is, um, it's like, man, he's a, he's a kind of much smaller guy than Stallone. Like looking at them, like. Yeah, you know, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he's just holding his own against them. Yeah. And kind sure. of winning the fight for a good portion of it. Yeah. Until, until he's, he's not and we get yeah. another one of. Another one of uh, Judge Dredd's, Judge Dredd's famous catchphrases: uh, yes. "Courts, courts adjourned," and um, he is thrown off the Statue of Liberty and has a very uh, Alan Rickman in Die Hard style death. Yeah, Whereas that's kind of which were very, very popular in the nineties of people falling off things and yeah. th- in slow motion. And then Hershey saves Dredd for was it the third? The because third time, a, yeah. The third, that's that's the that's the third time. Um, that's so. an ongoing joke, I guess she has with him about all the time she's helped him out and saved him, and <laughs> and um, yeah. And oh so, I, no 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 uh, yeah. yeah because like yeah yes after being headbutted Ilsa comes back and um, try, tries to shoot Dread but is shot through the back by Hershey and that is the, that is the third time. That she has uh, helped Dread out, so like um, own of, own her favors, and I mean that pretty much wraps it up. Yeah, uh, it 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 feels very abruptly that just it's just kind of uh again we get a little exposition dump of kind of like oh yeah everything was broadcast so everybody knows your yeah. accent it's all good now <laughs> the end <laughs> yeah they say do you want to be the new chief judge or justice and he goes no i'm a street judge and he just puts on his uniform to go out but then you know hershey kisses him because <laughs> then, yeah uh, because they've been yeah. love interests the whole time because that's yeah. been super well built up uh mm-hmm. but uh and yeah fergie, and yeah or, yeah and fergie gives commentary the whole time while he's on a stretcher of like oh i taught him everything he knows oh, i'm a better kisser than that you know it, it, that's dumb, but yeah. <laughs> Which I mean, you could say that about the whole performance yeah, and that yeah. whole that whole character <laughs> and its uh, terrible inclusion in this film. Um, but um, yeah, and that, that's 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 pretty much it. But like, oh, we do get like that one last time where he says, oh, "I knew, I knew you'd say that." You know, his other his other big catchphrase that we've yeah. been really selling in the movie. <laughs> yeah, and then he drives off, and you know the crowd of people are all cheering, and 
punching the air and and, you know, yeah. like, um, <laughs> and then he looks over like if he was on a horse. That's basically how it makes it show. Yeah, him. he kind of rides off into the sunset, and then yeah. uh, that's. And then he, he kind of gives a dramatic stare, and kind of the camera pans out, and then we, and we cut cut to credits. Oh, I should mention it, like um, you know, while this is happening, this kind of like riding off into the sunset, we get that uh, the the theme from from the movie, and um, the the movie ha- does have a fun score by Alan yeah. Silvestri, who is probably best known for his scores for the likes of Back to the Future and The Avengers and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so uh, so that's good. And uh, the end credits ends with uh, the, Dread song, uh, the Dread Song by The Cure, um, famous yeah. British goth band. Actually, it must be mentioned that, uh, like a lot of 90s movies, uh, the soundtrack for this is just great. Um, yeah, there, yeah. you know, like there might be a lot wrong with this movie, but the soundtrack is not one of them. You know, it's got <laughs> Cure, it's got you know, like White Zombie, um, it's got the the British dance group uh, Left Field. It's got a whole bunch of great stuff. You know, that's 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 a great thing about uh, '90s movies. All of them had great soundtracks. There's not, it's not kind of as popular now to do that. I don't think, like you know, the no. official soundtrack, uh, you know, motion motion picture soundtrack is like, um, yeah. But I actually, I, well, that's a whole nother conversation. I read because it's so expensive now to, I guess, get the rights for songs. That, ah, that's why, okay. Okay. why they avoid it. Like they, you know, where they used to have the whole, yeah, you know, beautiful soundtracks. And yeah, I forgot about The Cure being one of them. So as the credits were rolling, I was, you know, sitting up for my seat and going to grab something. I'm like, wait a minute. That's the cure. What are they doing <laughs> on here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Apparently, the end song was originally going to be done by the Manic Street Preachers. Okay. But yeah, their original, their original singer um, went missing. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and was never was never seen again. Presumed yeah. dead, unfortunately. But um, yeah, and then that kind of derailed. Um, that kind of derailed that for for them, and you know, like um, they obviously like regrouped and you know made a whole lot more music um, afterwards. But um, yeah, yeah, and then uh, the Cure uh, swooped in and uh, did the, that song, Dread Song, um, which was pretty good, pretty good <laughs> yeah. song. No, I, I mean, the Cure are a great band, so I'm like yeah, yeah. You know. oh, and that's. And that really, that really is it. That that is pretty much all we've got to say on <laughs> Judge Dredd. Unless you unless you have anything else to add, Craig. No, I think I added it all in the beginning. I think yeah, that was the issue that, and we kind of had the same issue with Demolition Man. I mean, which is better, but that there's so much to talk about in the beginning because there's so much world building, and then after that, everything kind of becomes this like. Every, you know, rapid pace, quick blur of like. Yeah, uh, uh, it's, it's just kind of throws out everything. Like, yeah, Demolition Man at least retains some of that identity throughout the movie. Um, whereas this movie is just like, just throws everything out. And it's just like, oh yeah, and then there's going to be this subplot. And then, yeah, like, we're going to introduce the Angel Gang because, like, they're famous from the comics, and but then we're going to kill them off in five minutes, and then yeah, well, oh, the clones, and yeah, uh, yeah, like more Rico stuff, and uh, you know, it's, it's yeah, yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> but uh, that is just our thoughts on Judge Dredd. Yeah. Please be sure to give us uh, your thoughts, um, and please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, yeah, listen to us uh, wherever you get podcasts. And um, But that's all for this time. Uh, that's all for me, Scott, and uh, all from Craig. Yep. And, I, the uh, court's adjourned. <laughs> Courts adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and it just leaves me to say we will see you next time when the two of us will be talking about another film from 1995. It is Sylvester Stallone and Antonio Banderas in Assassins. But until then, see ya!